and honestly, what I, what I want you to, to hear from me is not that I'm just your youth pastor coming up here and, and preaching to you. I, I actually want to be like your older brother in Christ coming up here and just sharing with you the last 13 years of my life as being a Christ follower. I'm not going to go through details. I'm not going to do anything like that. But I, I just, I want to I wanna come up here and share with you, not not as your pastor. I can't sit. <laughs> I, I, some pastors sit. It looks cool. I, I can't sit. Um, I, I don't want to come here and preach to you tonight. I want to come up here and share with you from an older brother perspective of what it's been like living as a Christian. What it's been like living as a believer. The struggles, the excitements, the frustrations. I want to share that with you because the resonating tone that I hear over and over again is I'm not going to give up the way I'm living because life is too good right now. Like, why would I want to give that up? There's two different categories in people who believe in Christ. There's the category who is so broken and their life is such a disaster that they have absolutely nowhere else to go but Christ. And then there's a category that teeters on their relationship with Christ because the world is giving them good things and life is good, but they know that they should have a faith over here. And what I want you to understand is I was in this category. My life wasn't broken. I wasn't a messed up kid. I didn't have terrible issues. I was on that teeter, on that seesaw of the world giving me good stuff and I knowing that I should have faith in Christ. That's where I teetered. And I know a lot of us in this room, that's exactly where we are in life. The world is good to us. Satan has done a good job at showing us that we can get what we want or life is good and we don't really need God only in the hard times. A lot of us believe that and I believe that. That's where I was when I was your age. I was right there. So what I want to talk to you about tonight, I don't want to preach to you. I don't want to get up here and give you a lecture. I want to simply come up here as an older brother to say, I love you, and I just want you to listen to my experience between God and I over the last 13 years, 12, 13, 14 years. I want you to see how I experienced my walk, because I can preach to them blue in the face, and a lot of you just going to say, I'm not going to change my ways. But maybe if you see, maybe if you see the impact that Christ has had on me, and the fact that I pushed away from him and I wanted to get away from him and I wanted him just when it was good for me and see how he still continually chased and pursued me even though I pushed him away. I'm praying and hoping that some of you go, you know what, it's time for me to make that choice. It's time for me to live that life that I should be living. Instead of saying, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to give this up. The world is too darn good for me. I'm not going to give it up. Because I want you to understand what God has for you completely blows anything this world can ever offer you out of the water. I'm talking about not even the same universe. Totally a different universe. That's what I want you to get from me tonight. Is that I struggle just like you guys. I went through those same struggles. I go through the same struggles that you guys go through. I live, just because I'm a pastor and I get to read the Bible all day, no, I don't really do that, but I do sometimes, but doesn't mean that I've got all my stuff together. It doesn't mean that just because I work for a church, I'm some goody two-shoes and I've got a special seat next to God. It doesn't happen that way. I am just like you. I've just chosen to choose a path that I'm going to be held a lot more responsible for because there's a lot of people that I pray for and I oversee and I'm responsible for your faith and your relationships with God. So I want you to see that for the last 13 years, it, it, it's, it wasn't just some pretty, beautiful, nice ride. Following Christ is not, the most, is not the most easy thing to do. The easiest thing, you know, not the most easiest thing. Not the easiest thing you can do. But it's totally worthwhile. And it's worth it. And I want to share with you, and we'll, we'll go over some verses in a little bit. These were verses that God showed me. See, I, I struggled for a long time with being on that fence, really being on that fence. I, I lived a double life. I lived for God on Wednesdays. Did a real good job. I was great at it. I mean, people, they ate it up. They loved it. The youth pastor wanted me here because he saw that their kids liked it, that I was here. So they, I ate it up. The attention was galore. I ate it up. So on Wednesdays and Sundays, I was here. But... On Mondays, on Tuesdays, on Thursdays, on Fridays, on Saturdays, I did whatever I wanted. 
I didn't even care to open my Bible. I didn't even care to pray. I didn't even care to look at anything else at all. I lived the way I wanted to live. I li definitely lived a two-faced life. And I did that for many years. And I want to share with you the verses that, man, God just impacted me with. So out of this, I want you to understand that I'm not coming to you to say that I've got it all figured out. Because I don't. I don't have it all figured out. I share with you what I learn. That's what I share with you. As I learn God's word, I get excited about it, and I come to you and I share it to you. That, that's, what we, that's how this works. I, I read through and I'm like, man, that was amazing. I want to share that with the kids or the, or the students. So I write it down in my, in my sermon planner and my notes. And I'm like, all right, one day we're going to get to this verse. And that's, I share it with you because I've learned because God's impacted me. It's not like I just opened a Bible. I'm like, oh, this would, be, this would be perfect to preach out of. No, it's because I had to learn it. I learned it. And I'm like, wow, this is so great. I got to share this with them. So that's what's happening tonight. It's the fact that I struggled with this for a long time. And I don't have it all figured out. I'm not coming to you to tell you you have to do it the same way I do it. That's not what I'm doing. I'm not coming here to say you have to live the same exact way I live. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what this, that's not what this talks about. I'm not coming to tell you that you're doing it wrong and that you need to do it this way. That's not what I'm coming to tell you tonight. So don't tune me out. That, that's not what this is about. It's not about you're doing it wrong and you need to do it this way. No, this is about me saying this is how I did it. And these are the mistakes and this, the mess ups that I had and how I stumbled. And if I can at least tell you and you can avoid those humps in your life, those bumps in the road, then you'll have a lot smoother life than I had at that point. And that, that's what I want to share with you is my testimony of what I've been through and the struggles that I went through. And mainly, I want us to understand this. Listen, life is confusing. Life is frustrating. Life is hard. Life's hard. Anybody that gets up and preaches and says life's not hard, they're lying to you. They're lying to you. Life is hard. I don't care whether you are a saint or you're not. Life is hard. But see... There's something about life that when we have Jesus, we have peace. And when we have peace, even though life is frustrating and confusing and hard, none of it seems to matter because we have peace. We have understanding. We, we get this. We understand why the world is so messed up. We understand. We get it. I went to uh, the food store. I call it a food store. The food stand the other day to buy my wife some honey. I like walked into the fruit stand and there's this guy with a Spanish accent, very, very thick. And all he was saying is stupid Americans, stupid Americans. I hate all the stupid Americans. And I was just like, what? Like, what do you, excuse me? You know, you don't like us then leave. I, mean, I wanted to say that to him, but I didn't. And I'm like, what are you talking about here? So I just kept my mouth shut. It was very hard. Um, <laughs> And I'm just shopping and looking. I'm looking at the honey and stuff. And, and I just hear him talking about how, oh, I've served this country for 35 years. I gave my life in war and blah, 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 blah. And on and on he was going. And about how life was so hard. And it was so it was just, he was just going on and on and on about how life was just terrible and all this. He's probably, I don't know, maybe 75. He was a crossing guard. He had like a little badge on and, you know, a little thing was hanging off there. <laughs> and all I could think in my mind was, Thank you, Jesus, that I have peace. This guy is so distraught and frustrated and angry. And you can tell that it's something that he's struggled with for many years of his life. And he's an older man. I mean, like I said, he's probably 75. He's an older guy. And you can tell that it was weighing him down. Before I got the chance to go over there and say something, it's probably how God timed it because he knew he didn't want me to say something to him. The gentleman left. And all I could think to myself is, holy cow, like, God, I'm so happy that, yeah, the world is messed up, okay? We saw in Genesis when it all got messed up that it was just going to get worse. It didn't say, the, the world's going to get better, that sin's here. No, not at all. Like, it's just gotten worse. And we see that as time progresses, it's just going to get worse. But because of the faith that we have in Christ, we can have peace. And there's peace with that. 
And that's that piece that I struggled with for many years, that when I finally came to that understanding of peace, when I finally came to that, it was like a, just a light bulb went on. It was like, okay, all right. This, this is how the world's going to be. This is what it's going to be like. But you know what? I have faith. I've got hope. I got peace. I have a purpose in life. I've got peace. I'm, I'm good. So there's those things that I want to talk specifically about tonight, and that's my hope, my purpose. Well, excuse me? I think somebody's cell phone's going off back there. They're going to smash my face into a jelly. <laughs> Somebody might need to get their phone, whoever's phone that is, before it goes off again. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought that kid was back there for a second. I was really like, what? Anyways. Shh. It might be Tim's. I don't think he's in here. I want to share with you my hope, my purpose, and how I gain peace. And I want you to see this because this is extremely important for you to understand. It's extremely important for you to see because if you don't have hope, you are going to be searching for something for a very long time that you are never going to find. There, with hope comes a purpose. And when we don't have a purpose, we're just looking for something. We're trying our best to fulfill ourselves, to satisfy ourselves with everything we possibly can because nothing, for, nothing satisfies us. Nothing will sustain us. So we're continually looking for something to make us happy. So first we have hope, then purpose, and then comes peace. Because when we have hope, we have a purpose. And when we have a purpose in life, then we have peace. And what I mean by peace, I don't mean that the world will always be calm around us. I don't like live in a bubble and as I like walk into other people's bubbles, they're just like, oh. It doesn't work like that. But okay, that would be really cool. It'd be like trying to bounce off everybody. You know what I mean? Like, oh, they're bad. Wait You know, they're just like, oh, God. Cool. That doesn't work like that, okay? What I mean by peace is, is, is we have peace. I would see some of you making that into a game. You know, make your, mat, your dad as mad as possible and you just jump on him. And he's like, oh, I love you. No, it, does, it doesn't work like that. Peace. Shh. The peace I talk about is a peace you don't understand unless you love Jesus. Period. End of subject. The peace I talk about is, is as a peace that is settling of spirit, settling of soul. And you just know, you know, you know that you're okay. You know that God's got you. You know what salvation is. You know that you have a hope in eternity with Christ forever. You know what that peace is. So my hope, my hope is that one day I'll sit at the feet of God and worship him eternally. I don't necessarily mean just sitting. I'm excited and in praying that when I get to heaven, that God allows me to to worship him in, in many facets. Maybe not just sitting at a throne, and walk, looking at him at a throne and worshiping him, but a sense of being able to worship God in, in many opportunities. I'm sure he has it. That, that's what my hope is. My hope is that one day when I die, when I take my last breath on this world, because it will happen. None of us are destined for eternity physically. Not going to happen. One day we will die. Many of you in this room have experienced young death. You have a friend who has died young. Many of you have a loved one who has died young. You know what death is. You understand what death is. It's a person. Death comes from a person dying, exactly. My hope is that when I physically croak, when I am done, that I will have an eternity with God. That's what my hope is. When I was younger, we had a study in Revelation. It was not a very in-depth one. It was more or less a thrown one. And actually, Kurt kind of... <laughs> <laughs> that's Kurt. If that's a Wagner's phone, go get it. It is. Okay, so then somebody get it. Just go, go find it. It's okay. Just get it and get it over here. Because <laughs> I'm not going to focus if that keeps going on. <laughs> oh, it's right there. I'm just going to take this. Oh, I thought it was like back there somewhere. Okay, so in Revelations 4, if you got your Bibles, open up to Revelations 4. If you don't have a Bible, we have plenty of them, so grab them, all right? We're in Revelations 4. I want to share this verse with you because 
Revelations 4. Yeah, it is the last book in the Bible. If you have the Bible that I'm using, it's page 856. So I, I remember this study. Um, I don't remember what the whole study was on. Shh. As we focus here, I don't remember what the whole study was on. Uh, pay, again, if you if you have the Bible I'm using, it's page 856. But I remember that we were going through a study of Revelations, and I remember particularly at that point in my life, I, I was really struggling with my faith. I was really struggling with living both in the world and, and for Christ. I was really struggling with it. Um, not not like depression or anything like that, but like I knew that God was pulling me, but I was trying my best to run away from Him. And run as fast as I could. And we did this study in Revelation. And this particular uh, section of verses is verses 1 through 11. We're not going to read through all of it. There's two sets, some verses that I'm going to read. But a little description on it. This is giving us a description of, of what the temple in heaven kind of looks like. What's going to be going on in that temple. Uh, how God is going to be worshipped. How some worship is happening in the temple. There's... Uh, two verses specifically that I want to share with you that really impacted me in my faith, in my walk, where I was. Because at this point, I knew what the word hope meant, but I hadn't experienced it. I hadn't realized what it was. I knew that there was hope, and people talked of hope, especially the adults. The leaders in the youth group, they talked of hope all the time, hope all the time. They talked of it, and they shared about it. So at this point in my life, I, I knew what the word hope meant, but, but I didn't experience it. If we get to verse uh, <clears throat> 8, at the end of verse 8, we see, or I'll read whole verse 8. It says, each, it says, each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes, and inside and out, day after day, night after night, they kept on saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. And you think about that, and you're like, what did he just say? <laughs> A beast with six eyes, on the, or with six wings and eyes on the inside and the outside of the wings. And What blew my mind about this verse was this statement here. It said, Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. And the still to come is what totally rocked my world. He's still to come. Because it's really hard to pick up a Bible that's 2,000 years old and relate to it sometimes. I get that. I was 14, 15, 16 one time. And sometimes I'd pick the word up and be like, this happened 2,000 years ago. How does this have anything to do with me? And then one day it just kind of clicked. God has always been, always been, always. There, there's no start date to him. He has just been there. Yeah, that, that blows my mind. Totally rocks my world. He has just always been there. Another great kicker is that he's still coming back for us. He's still going to come back. He's still going to return. See, Jesus came the first time and died on the cross for our salvation to give us salvation, to give us a relationship that was once separated, to give us that relationship with God again. And, and Jesus left. He ascended. He went back to heaven. He is in glory right now, and he still is going to return. He's still going to come back. And that kind of, I was like, what? Wait a second. You mean he, he's just not gone forever? Like he's gone and one day he's going to show up? No, like he, it's, it's commanded. He will return. He is going to come back for us. Verse 11 says, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. Did you hear that last statement there? You created what you pleased. In Genesis, when God created all things, he said all things were great. 
God created me. He created me and he was pleased with it. He was pleased to create me. He didn't just sit up on his throne one day and say, you know what? I'm going to make humans just because. Yeah, what the heck? I got nothing else to do. That's not what he did. He was pleased to create us. He was pleased to, to make us. He was pleased to make you. Psalms tells us that God knows us before we're even born. He was pleased to make you. You didn't just pop out. <laughs> like, he made you. And when I was 14, 15 years old, this text rocked my, it shook my foundations. Because I was not worshiping a distant God anymore. Some of you come in and you say, all right, I'm going to worship God, but I feel like he's 100,000 miles away. He's, he's like over there, like up there, and I can't reach him, I can't touch him. This verse brought him down to a level to where I could, I could experience him. Because he was pleased. He, he was pleased to create me. He wanted to create me. He wants a relationship with me. Just like he wants a relationship with you. He, he wants a relationship with you. He created you. There is a purpose to your life. And I struggled with that for many years. I just didn't have a purpose. Why am I here? And you think, man, how can a 14-year-old guy think of that? Well, we do. <laughs> and all of you do. There are nights that you'll probably sit in your bed and you'll stare at the ceiling and you wonder, why... Why am I here? What is my purpose? God, why did you put me here? My hope was that I would have eternity with Christ. To have eternity with Christ. That's what my hope was. So now that I had hope, I had hope. I had, a, I had hope in life. There, there's a reason for me being here. And that drove me into my purpose. So I understood my hope, and now I'm pushed to my purpose. What do you think my purpose is? What do you guys think my purpose is? Go ahead. You can just blurt it out. <laughs> okay. Go for it. Living God's name. Living God's name, okay. What's your purpose? Justin, what's your purpose? Glory God, God through music. Jenna, what's your purpose? Glorify God through my writing. To glorify God through my writing. Christian, what's your purpose? No, we all know. To glorify God with my community itself. Community itself. There's three words that they said in there, and they hit it so hard. To glorify God. My purpose in life is to glorify God. That's all I'm called to do, is glorify God. That's it. My purpose in life is to glorify God. Your purpose in life is to glorify God. Christians is through comedian. Jen is to write. Justin's with music. Maybe some of you is to, to be a doctor. Maybe it's to be a school teacher. Maybe it's to be a band geek for the rest of your life and then teach band when you get older. Maybe, maybe it's, I don't, I don't know, you know? A what? A scooter, a scooter rider? You know? Maybe it's a football player? Maybe it's to be a garbage driver? I don't know. Listen, it, shh, this is where I finally made it click with the purpose because I struggled. Listen, I thought that in order to glorify God in what I did, I had to become something great. And I, and I wanted to become something that was above and beyond everything else. It had to be perfect. But then I came to the realization that because I have hope in Christ, I now have a purpose. And that purpose is very simple. It's to glorify God. Glorify God. Music. Writing. Comedian. Working in a business. Working as a believer in a business. Being an accountant. I, it doesn't matter. You're, you're glorifying God. And you're glorifying God in what you do. That's how you are. That, that's what your purpose is. Yeah, I, I preach. That's, that's what I do. That's what God's called me to specifically do. My responsibility is to glorify God when I preach. It's to glorify God. That's what the purpose of our life is, is glorifying Him. It looks different in many ways. 
It's different to each one of us. And the one consistency in all of it is that we are called, called to glorify him. That's what we're called to do, is glorify God. And many of you are hung up on that. Because you feel that you have to give up your whole world in order to glorify God. God's just calling you to glorify him. And through glorifying him, you'll realize that there are some things in life that you just don't need anymore. But that's in time. That's in process. That takes time to do. Our responsibility as believers is to glorify God. Our responsibility is to understand that we have hope in salvation through Jesus Christ and to glorify him. You can be a race car driver. I don't care. Ice cream giver. You know, like a... <laughs> if you're glorifying God, and listen to me, if you're glorifying God in it, then you're doing it right. It's through glorifying God. Does that mean that when you're like, you know, handing the kids ice cream, you're like, praise Jesus! He dies! You want some sprinkles? Holy Spirit sprinkles! Like, it's not... You don't have to do it like that, okay? But you're, you have peace in what you're doing. That would be so funny. We need to open up an ice cream shop. Here's, here's some Holy Spirit ice cream. Here's some Holy Spirit ice cream. Bam! Sorry, I don't know where that came from. It just happened. What's a gay's purpose in life? So, so, no, no, no. That's a much, that's a, shh, boys. One, one, as a Christian, here I'm going to put it out there very simply so you can understand this. As a believer in Christ, you are called to not hate the person, but hate the sin. You understand? So if somebody chooses to chase after that specific lifestyle, you're not to hate them for that lifestyle. You're to hate the sin that they're chasing, just like somebody who's a drunk, somebody who's an addicted person to alcohol. Boys, that's enough. You're not to, you're not to downgrade them as a person because they are human and because they have, they have a sin desire that they're chasing after, just like if you drank alcohol and you were an alcoholic, just like if you were a person who was addicted to drugs or, or addicted to pornography. There is an addiction in your life. There's substance in your life that is sinful, and they've chosen to chase after that. They've been blinded. Satan has blinded them, and they're chasing after that. So we shouldn't make fun of that because that's a serious issue, not, not just on gays, but on all sin. It's a very serious issue in dealing with that. So that's my little blow on Casey. Anyway, so let's get back to it. Purpose. Shh. So I found what my purpose was, and that was to glorify God. We're going to wrap this up. It's to glorify God. There's four simple things that I really, as I was bringing this message together over the last couple of weeks to share with you guys, there's some things that I wanted to share with you guys over the last couple of weeks. And it is this. We bring God glory by worshiping him. Worship can be, worshiping him can be far, far more than, than, than singing. It can be far more than praying, reading God's word. It can be in all things you do. You can glorify God. You can worship God in all things. And that's glorifying him. That's glorifying him. We bring glory to God by loving other believers. Romans 15, 7 says, Therefore accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be glorified. Follow, uh, follow, following Christ is not just a matter of believing it. It also indicates belonging and learning to love each other as family. We do that really well in, in this youth group. We do that really well. We, we love each other really well in this youth group. So we can worship God by doing all things and that's bringing glory to him. We can bring glory to God by loving other believers. This one's tough. This is what I really, this weighs on my heart. We bring God glory by becoming more Christ-like. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, So all who have had the veil removed can see the reflection of the, of the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Listen, spiritual maturity comes, it comes by living a life that's chasing after Christ. And, and I talked a little bit earlier about about hanging on that fence. 
about, I wasn't that person whose life was just in shambles. That wasn't me. Parents loved each other. They're still married today. They still love each other. They care about us. They support us. They were there for us. They supported us. My, my life was not in shambles. So I was that guy who was on the other side of the fence that had a pretty good life, made some stupid mistakes that we all. But my biggest mistake was the fact that I lived a double life. I lived on both sides of the fence. I tried to. So I lived for God a couple days a week, but I mostly lived for the world the rest of the time. And let me tell you that that was the biggest struggle. It still is today a big struggle of mine because as a, a young married man, I want success. I want to provide my wife and my family with everything that I can give them. They, I want to be wealthy. I want to be rich. I want them to be satisfied and fine. That's what I want as a, as a person. So I still struggle between those two things. <clears throat> but see, where the choice was made in my life is that when I realized that I need to give up what I was trying to pursue over here in the world and, and, and give all that I could on the Christ and focus all of my attention on the Him. And you know what? This is serious. There are people that I was friends with that despise God now because of me. You know why? It's because I was a fake. It was because I was a liar. It was because I lived a life and said, oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But then when we hung out, I was cussing, doing whatever the world was doing. I was involved with it. I was doing it. And those guys saw me go to church on Wednesday. Those guys saw me go to church on Sunday. Over and over again for years, they saw that. And now those guys despise God. And that's because of me. That's because of the way that I lived my life. Because I was a fake and I was a liar. So to me, living for Christ is so much more than just trying to do the right things. It's literally going to save somebody. Like you're going to save somebody. I have a weight on my spirit that I know shouldn't be there because it's just what happened. But I know that there are some guys that I love, love, and I would love to share God with them. But I know that I am in no way or form or shape at all the person to do that because I am the reason that they despise him. And that sucks. And I want you to learn from my mistake that there are going to be people you love in your life. And by you living two separate lives, trying to live them together, you are doing nothing but pushing them farther away from God. And one day, we will be held accountable. We will be held accountable for it. I live my life on two separate, actually on one island trying to hold up two separate <laughs> islands. Like I wanted both things. But it finally came to the realization, it finally came to God, finally just rocking my world. I had one of my buddies come up to me, it was real late. Uh, we were hanging out in the backyard. He came up to me and, and and he kind of, we were just kind of talking and listening to some radio and stuff. And he, you know, he turned the radio down. And he said, you know what, JP, I want to ask you a question. How can you, how can you preach to us on Wednesdays and, and, and show us that you have to go to church, but yet you still do the same exact thing that I'm doing? I have no God. I don't worship God. I, there's no God in my life. You're, you're no different than I am. There's nothing different about you than me. Nothing. It was through that experience that I started to look at my life and started looking at the fact that, wow, th this kid's right. He's, he's completely right. I was living for myself when it was convenient for me. And when I was in trouble, I would, I would ask God to help me. I would run to God when things were tough. <coughs> and I lived those two separate lives. And because of that, now there's people that despise God. I'm telling this to you for you to learn. Not for you to feel bad. Don't feel bad. Learn. Learn from my experiences. Learn from what I'm teaching you and telling you. I'm not telling you this to guilt you or anything. No, I'm telling you this to say, hey, there are people you love. There are people you care about. That because of the way you're living your life right now, you're pushing them away. Away from God. Not from yourself. You're pushing them away from God. And that is far worse 
than anything else you can do. Stop. <laughs> Did I scare you? <laughs> Stop. Why? Because our outward expression glorifies God. Our outward expression does. Last week we talked about filtering your mind, about filtering the things that you take into your mind, music, television. And a lot of us, we don't want to filter that stuff. We don't. We don't want to filter music. We like the music we listen to. We like the TV we watch. We like the movies, the books, whatever. We like that stuff. I get it. I was there. You are going to save yourself so much heartache by realizing that there's just some of that stuff you don't need. I'm not saying that that you don't need none of it. What I'm saying is that there are some of those things that you're going to come to the understanding and the realization, there's just some of that you won't need. And that comes to my last thing, peace. Peace. And then we're going to wrap this up. (coughs) God gave us hope through Jesus Christ to have eternity with him. Because of that hope, we have a purpose, and that's to glorify God. And when we have hope and peace, I mean hope and, and, um, man, I just lost it. A purpose. When we have hope and a purpose, it gives us peace. Some of you are itching for peace. Some of you are are craving peace. Your life is not peaceful. Your spirit is not peaceful. There's a war waging in your heart. And it is roaring. And you're in shambles. Follow up the ladder a little bit. What's your purpose? What's your purpose? If you have no purpose, what's your hope? What's your hope? I'm I'm not talking about tomorrow. I'm talking about the day after you die. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about tomorrow. I'm talking about on death's bed, your last breath. Where are you going after you die? Where are you going? What's going to happen? What is it? That's what I'm talking about. After you die, I've got hope, I've got a purpose, and I've got peace. And I've learned that over the last 13 years, that it's those three things that give me the faith that I have in Christ. And it's because of those three things that I have the courage to stand up here and talk to you, that I have the courage to stand up and say, hey, I'm not preaching to you, I'm coming to you as an older brother saying, hey, I have been there, I've dealt with it, it sucks. Please get away from it. Run away from it. It's like a daddy in, in, in fire with a little baby like on an oven, you know? Like you don't want the kid to run up and be like, wah! And just be like, wah! You know, on top of the stove. Like I'm like that big guy coming over saying, don't put your hand on the stove. It's hot. But instead I'm talking about your eternity. Instead I'm talking about your life. I'm saying, hey, don't do that. Don't go through that heartache. Don't deal with that. There's no reason for it. We've experienced it. We don't want you to. I want to save you a lot of crying and a lot of heartache. As we allow Christ to work in our lives with his promise, we begin to glorify God and and, and we, we become a different person. We become more like Christ. And because of that, we glorify him through all things we do. Through all things we do. Many of you are going to ignore everything I said tonight. Some of you, I'm going to have struck a nerve. And you're really going to think deep about that. And that's good. You should. Your purpose is to glorify God. And by doing that, you're going to have peace. And there's going to be no question whether something's right or wrong. You're going to know whether it's right or wrong. And that's because of that peace that's going to be in you. As Christ followers, we are to imitate Christ. We are to follow him. And in following him, that takes faith. It takes strong faith. And I encourage you guys to really examine your lives and where it's at, your pure actions. The actions that you show the world, that is the greatest way you can preach God's word, is by the way you live. The actions of my two-faced preached the wrong thing and people ran from God. And now I'm determined to live a life that preaches God's glory because I want people to see God. I want people to see God. I don't want people to run from God. I want them to see God. 
Father, we love you. God, we thank you so much for this great time. Thank you for just allowing me to be up here and just talk and just to have a conversation and to share my life over the last 13 years and what you've shown me. You've shown me that I need hope and purpose. And because of that, I have peace. I have strong faith, God, because I know that you love me, that you sent your son to die for me, God. And I pray that you will show each and every one of these students in this room that exact thing, God. That it's hope. And it's that peace, Father, that you... You share with us. That gives us that strong faith, God. Father, we just ask you to bless us now. Take care of us. Protect us throughout this week. Give us a great week, God. And just bring us back next week for an awesome awesome topic on sex. What is sex? What is sex in the Bible? What does the Bible have to say about sex? I pray that you'll begin to prepare us mentally, physically, and maturely. God, we just ask you to do that for us in Jesus' name. Amen.